Peace Society Art Talk Series in COVID Times. My name is Tansa Mermerci Ekşioğlu, and I'm a board member at American Turkish Society. I'm the founding member and managing director at Spot Projects, and I'm currently the international head of patronage at Proto Cinema. I'm privileged and honored to be hosting spectacular and professional voices from the art world. Simon Preston, Marie Spirito, and Eli Fras are our keynote speakers today. Welcome. Thank you. I look forward to the light you will shed on today's topic. The talk will last about an hour and each of our speakers will have about 15 minutes and then we'll open the ground for q and I'm just gonna go ahead and ask each one of our speakers to introduce themselves. Simon. Thank you, Tanza. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to join this panel of colleagues and friends. And um, I, I currently work with uh, Alan Schwartzman, who is a sort of preeminent art advisor here in New York City, mm -hmm. um, uh, and has basically functioned as a advisor to not only some very significant collectors in the US and abroad, but also has worked really on large scale civic projects from Inner Chim Sculpture Park in Brazil to the Glenstone Museum just outside Washington. Uh, and his longest client, Harold Wachowski, the Wachowski family in Dallas. Yes. Um, prior to that, I was, uh, I was the sort of owner director of, of a gallery down the Lower East Side, Simon Preston, that ran for 10 years and closed in 2018. Thank you. And Marie? Um, thanks, Tanza. This is fun. <laughs> um, thanks, John Set and Ella and everyone at the American Turkish Society. I'm super excited. Um, and my name is Mary Spirito, and I'm the founding director and curator of Proto Cinema, which is a cross cultural, itinerant, nonprofit art organization operating between New York, Istanbul, and sometimes other places, which I'll tell you about later. Thanks. Great. Elif, welcome. Thank you, Tansa and American Turkish Society, for inviting me to be part of this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my name is Edith Ras. I, um, uh, I was born in Ankara and I went to school here in New York and I've been based um, between New York and Istanbul, uh, making work in both places. I work primarily with ceramics, painting and drawing and currently I'm a resident at the um, Museum of Arts and Design in New York. Great everyone, welcome again. So my first question will go to Simon. I have three questions for each speaker. So we're just gonna be you know, having about five minutes max to answer all the questions. So as an expert in the New York gallery scene, Simon, you who, you who have worked extensively with art professionals, curators, collectors, and artists, and as the recently appointed preeminent collector advisor to, at Alan Schwartzman Group, you know that the art world heavily relies on in-person dialogues and interactions to encourage sales. Um, how has COVID affected the sales and, the, and or the dealings among the collectors, gallery owners and artists and who has suffered the most and who did not? Um, I think in many ways this period of, of uh, isolation has actually affected or sort of reflects and mirrors many of the inequalities elsewhere in society in a way. We have this high end of the art market that has sort of remained, if anything, has had an uptick um, that kind of underscores, you know, quality and rarity. You know, there's always a demand for that. And there's certainly a great deal of money at that end of the market. Mm -hmm. um, it's been interesting that the kind of whole auction apparatus somehow is minimally affected by this. I think if anything, they've benefited from moving everything to the virtual, the major expense of having to deliver catalogs to the world and print catalogs is gone. People have very quickly adapted to looking at sales online. Mm -hmm. I think that market is so international. People are used to bidding on a telephone. So bidding online is, is, is really very little change. So that has kind of quite happily coasted along as it has. If anything, there's just been a kind of multitude of online auctions. We've sort of been kind of uh, beaten by the sheer volume. Um, I think the real most affected is certainly sort of the mid-tier and more emerging galleries, I think, where who, are, who work tirelessly 
to sort of introduce new artists to the market. Uh, and I think it's there that in-person dialogue is more critical. And, you know, the efforts from sort of the gallery system and nonprofits to really make these introductions, install shows, explain, you know, some of the more complex ideas at hand, it's just lost in this moment. It's been replaced in certain ways, but I think they're the, they're, they're, they're the, the sort of, that's the sort of part of the system that's has had to really be creative. On the positive side, that's often where the creative thinking is done. So they're best placed to kind of figure their way out of the, the issues. And I think there's many examples of things that have happened in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what do we do in order to cultivate or recultivate the art uh, dealing ecosystem? And what, what measures are there? And can you please talk a little bit about the Global Gallery Climate Coalition? I think there's been a lot of, it's been wonderful to see, you know, creative minds come together and, 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 and think of solutions. I mean, that's sort of been one of the most positive and kind of inspiring aspects of, of this. Um, the Gallery Climate Coalition is certainly one example of that, which really was started by, by the directors of the Freeze Art Fair and a number of kind of gallery owners who really decided that they'd really seen too much uh, excess and waste and sort of disregard for mm -hmm. their sort of carbon footprint and have come together and basically provide the tools to galleries now to be able to kind of measure and kind of commit to emission kind of reduction. I think from that's from one end, which is you know really just tool building to sort of a more recent thing that's a, appeared is this museum exchange, whereby you know the sort of online catalogs of works for donation that now are kind of you know on the whole museums have been very holden beholden to their trustees, and that's where their pool of donations have come from, particularly in the U.S. where there's very little federal funding for the arts. So there's always this reliance on, on the sort of private individual. Uh, so this museum exchange is basically an online catalog for, for museums to go to and say, you know, we don't have, for collectors who are donating work, they want to know that it's going to be shown and shown to an audience where it's appreciated and not in a basement. And I think this allows smaller mid-sized museums to really pick work that's on offer for donation and, and will be kind of critical to their, to their holdings. That's, that's, that's come out of, people sort of taking a step back and rethinking sort of a right. uh, sort of institutional model. Um, I think from the lower end, thinking, you know, more the sort of, for the, the, those more emerging galleries, I've certainly witnessed collectors really wanting to stay involved and keep connected, you know, mm -hmm. not being able to go and see exhibitions at galleries. So really moving kind of these visits online and, you know, studio visits, virtual studio visits with artists, which really can give an insight, you know, to, to, for collectors that might not have been available at another time. Yeah, um, yeah great. Um, well, do you, do you foresee changes in the gallery system looking towards uh, in, into the future? And can you maybe articulate, since you're a new member of the Alan Schwartzman group, <laughs> and all new agency models and um, and what do you reckon with respect to people's uh, collectors, artists reactions to this new agency models? I think there was a real sense of from everyone at every, uh, every level in the market that there was this consolidation rising to the top and these sort of mega galleries now representing mm -hmm. hundreds of artists mm -hmm. was not a healthy direction for the whole the art market at large to go. So I think there's been a lot of thinking as to alternatives to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in the past galleries with these kind of impenetrable fortresses, I think we'll see a lot more collaboration amongst yeah. the kind of mid tier gallery to sort of, you know, strengthen numbers will sort of push, you know, keep these bigger galleries, mega galleries at bay. I also imagine there's going to be other, other representation models of artists, artists that don't want to be one of a hundred artists on the list, but actually may want, sort of the art agent perhaps, and be just one of a, a couple, two or three artists managed by someone. I think there'll be a lot more alternative uh, models of representation, certainly. Right, right. Thank you, Simon. Um, Elif, um, I have a weird thing on my screen, so <laughs> I don't wanna just get rid of it, but I'm sure you're not seeing that, so perfect. 
Elifrim, your, your work centers on representations of women across different geographies and time, depicting women of agency at work and at home. With the onset of COVID, what are your observations on this agency and its repercussions on particularly your line, line of work as an independent artist? Sure. Um, as you know, most artists work in relative isolation most of the time. So it is true that some of us found this uninterrupted lockdown time to be not so much of a big shift from our pre-pandemic routines mm -hmm. and an opportunity for increased production. Um, of course, like everyone else, I had to face the postponement of shows, um, po uh, you know, cancellation of professional engagements and cutting off of access to uh, resources and production facilities. But uh, artists are resourceful and adaptable. So if one thing is not available, we move on to the next thing uh -huh. and try to make it through. Uh, so for me as a mother and an artist, um, the most difficult aspect of this time has been the loss of school. Um, you know, dropping my kid off at 8.30 every morning used to give me um, six hours, at least six hours of uninterrupted studio time. Uh, and, you know, right now going to the studio for the entire day is not an option. Uh, my kid is at home all the time. And like a lot of parents, I find myself having to be the substitute teacher, you know, which takes up pretty much half the day. So I adapted to this and set up work areas um, at my, in my apartment so I can, you know, whenever I could find time, I escape to those areas and try to work. Um, you know, if I can't go to the studio to paint, I can draw and, you know, make my pencil and gouache drawings at home. Um, you know, during the lockdown, my pottery studio closed down here too. So I wasn't able to make any work using the wheel or I wasn't able to fire my work. Um, you know, I was also not able to travel to Turkey like I regularly do to produce, you know, my work there in Izni. So I ended up ordering some clay and um, started building uh, at home uh, by hand. Uh, I had never hand built with clay. So this opened a whole new dimension for me in terms of process. And, you know, I started you know, exploring new forms and ideas. Uh, I also was able to focus on a research project that I had wanted to pursue for a while. And so I started thinking about a new body of work that is related to this research project, which will take some time to coalesce. So having, you know, no shows <laughs> for a bit for, provided the space for this. So, you know, in a way, uh, adaptation and flexibility, you know, has been key. Um, so yeah. getting back to the initial part of your question, uh, I have been able to observe firsthand how the virus is significantly increasing the burden of unpaid work, unpaid care, sorry, and domestic work, which mm -hmm. is proportionately carried by women. Uh, there's a lot of scholarship out there that show that women are bearing the brunt of the economic and social impact of COVID. Uh, both men and women increase um, and in in report an increase in unpaid work since the start of the pandemic, but women in heterosexual parent and single mother households are continuing to shoulder the bulk of the work as well as, you know, um, ending up dropping out of employment completely. Um, mm -hmm especially in a modernizing yet still very traditional society like Turkey, this will have severe repercussions um, like loss of agency and um, will exacerbate the already enormous problem of domestic violence. So uh, the structural inequities that already existed have been amplified. Uh, and as a society, we will need to address this. Um, as yeah. you mentioned, my work centers predominantly on representations of women and I have in the past included signifiers of unpaid care and domestic work in my work to draw attention to, to, the, to, the, to these inequities. Um, and I can say that the pandemic has reinforced my interest in this and I will continue thinking about these issues in my work. Um, and if, you know, I'm just gonna interrupt, uh, you know, our question for a minute. I'm just gonna go back to Simon who spoke a little bit less than his time and I'm just gonna grill okay. a little bit more, no. Um, Simon, do you think the women artists, um, you know, at a, at a worse uh, time than male artists? Like, I don't want to sound any. I mean, I think but without question. The agency issue here, work and home. What, do, do you have any observations on that? I think without question, but I, you know, I, I think everything that Alif said is, 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 is of 
you know paramount importance and 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 you know is sort of you know needs prioritizing but there is also i do see a more positive spin in the market of much greater inclusion and diversity of artists that are being collected and that there has been be it you know race or gender i think mm -hmm. there is genuinely you know there has been a shift i think collecting has evolved and people like to they're less interested in sort of trophies and I, I want to collect their social values essentially. And I think that's really a great evolution. Mary, I see you're nodding. Do you have, um, do you have something to add to this? Because you're also very, very much so involved in, uh, in this issue. So maybe a sentence? Yeah, thanks, Tanza. Um, yeah, I definitely, I see a huge turn in people that are collectors and patrons mm -hmm. um, or both that they, um, they're making a really big effort to be supportive of, um, you know, where their values are and their interests and in social justice across the board. Like it's becoming a huge, a huge issue. And, and I see a lot of action behind it as well. I think it's been a positive change. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Elif, coming back, um, as, you, as you also mentioned that with artists losing um, exhibition opportunities, production, having limited production facilities, and also the curfews uh, to personal interactions. Uh, how did you cope with that? And I want to ask this because um, you you are currently a resident at the Museum of Art and Design. Um, were you able to turn this period into one one that is opportunistic or or not? Yeah, um, I mean, there's always a silver lining, um, you know, um, with a, every uh, unfortunate event. So, I mean, just to give you a background, since last February, I, I was, I, as you said, I was, I started, I, I, last February, I started this residency at Museum of Arts and Design, and, um, you know, also called MAD. <laughs> MAD is a you know, six-month six residency, and each artist spends one or two days a week at the museum studio, and um, the museum audience is invited to uh, come into your studio and interact with you and ask you questions. Um, and you also have school groups coming in and uh, there is def definitely a um, you know, great diversity of audience in terms of gender, race and class in, at, at the MAD. Uh, but uh, a month into the residency, the museum shut down. So um, the residency had to go online. Uh, I was unable to access the studio and have the audience interaction, but as I said, the silver lining is that it provided a sense of community during this strange and uncertain time where I could get together with the fellow residents and museum staff and curators on Zoom and talk about our present reality as well as the work we were undertaking for the residency. Um, it also allowed me to structure my time better to, you know, pursue this research project that I had proposed for the, specifically for this residency. Um, and, and because uh, the public facing aspect of the residency also went online, we were having online studio visits uh, every month. So um, this uh, gave my work more visibility than, you know, I would have expected at, at this time. And uh, the museum also generously extended our residency to an entire year instead of six months. So uh, when the museum reopened in the, in the fall, um, we could go back to the studios, even though you know, now uh, the floor is just close you know, to the public and you know, right. work there. But um, you know, there's a wheel there and a kiln there. So I was able to further the work I had started during lockdown. Um, you know, as you know, making ceramics is like long and sometimes arduous process. Yeah. And some of these new works literally took six to seven months to finish from inception to the final firing. Um, but you know, I'm happy to be to have had the opportunity to you know produce my work uh, using the facilities there. And another um, silver lining for all of us, I, I assume, in this landscape is that we're able to attend any lecture or conversation we want. <laughs> you know, the right. art institutions and museums offer so many fantastic opportunities with amazing artists. So it's been a good time to sit back and just take in and learn. For example, um, like Guerrilla Girls have been uh, long been a you know source of inspiration for me for tackling social issues with biting humor and um, mm -hmm. just to give you for, for people who, who are not familiar with them these are artists 
uh, women artists who wear uh, gorilla masks in public to uh, mm -hmm. disguise their identity. And they have pursued uh, since the 1980s, a project dedicated to documenting and revealing the gender, in gender inequities in the art world and the world at large. So yesterday, you know, I've never been able to hear them in person. So yesterday, you know, they uh, were on my screen <laughs> uh, doing an artist talk with uh, at the Hirshhorn with the curator there. So, you know, this was like amazing and fascinating. One of the best things I've heard for a while. So, you know, if you want to check it out, I highly recommend it. It's on their website. I, I would love to. Um, but as for your visibility as an artist, like I, I think this maybe I will ask from different perspective of our speakers. Has um, your experience at the MAD uh, contributed to people getting to know you? I mean, your practice and maybe purchasing your work like um, because we're you're just mentioned. I, I didn't know that um, one one still couldn't visit the visit the museum in person. I, I hear because the museums are open and people can just wander so you, around. You can visit the museum. You just you know the 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 studios are not open to the public. I see. Uh, okay. like last, like yes, I came. <laughs> so how, how does this process affected your visibility in terms of your actual um, practice and maybe reaching out to the exits. Yeah, I mean, it just allowed me to reach this, you know, museum audience who, you know, um, you know, became more international thanks to that. I mean, actually, museum had mentioned that, you know, they were, um, you know, more local before and now um, because of, you know, the residents and their connections to the international art world, they had uh, more of an international, they start having more of an international type patronage and they're actually thinking of expanding since yeah. everything's online now, expanding this residency to perhaps an even international artists. So there's, you know, that aspect, um, mm -hmm. you know, but in terms of commercial prospects, I mean, I'm just, you know, taking this time as, um, as a sort of hunting in and, you know, just going inwards and taking it slow and 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 waiting till you know we reach um, a time where we can show arts and you know interact with audiences in a less restricted way okay um maybe simon you can just you know like uh, just say a few words about how this whole online process like the virtual studio visits you mentioned before affected the visibility and sales for certain artworks or the visibility of an artist and maybe the sale of a possible I think, I think I think it has enormously I think you know a lot of a lot of galleries have relied increasingly on the art fair kind of schedule to meet new collectors and and increasingly the sort of annual sales volume was done primarily often you know at, at art fairs and that's been a huge loss mm -hmm. Art fairs are very quick to kind of go to online viewing rooms, but I think, unlike that auction system that you know there seems to maintain, art fairs are about human conversation and interaction and relationship building, and I think an online fair just doesn't capture any of that energy and community, and you're looking at a lot of work that you might be just being introduced to into a very difficult thing. So. I think there have been a, there's a slow increase of the success of these online fairs or, you know, and I, and I think they might remain a component into the future, but no, I mean, that's, that's a very real loss. And we're all looking forward to, you know, some kind of, I don't think they'll be at the, at the pace that they were or the scale that they were. And even the first fairs that are coming back into the system are going to be obviously much reduced in number, right. which will probably, you know, beneficial for all involved. Um, Marie, um, and what would you, your take on this be? I'm um, my take on art fairs or? Um, yeah, artists. Um, or how to stay visible during this, these weird yeah. times. I'm just juggling with my. Yeah. Um, I think uh, how to stay visible during weird times is weird. <laughs> I think that um, it's it is really dynamic to have this um, online isolation 
like this yeah. mad rush for everything happening online and it's not mm -hmm. just you know my organ art organization and art talks and fundraising and stuff it's also like my relationship with my family and my friends and yeah. how I get groceries and it's <laughs> everything so I think that I'm having a really high value for the the small things we do in person, you know, safe, COVID safe things. Um, yeah. and really getting super into like, I bought so many more books this past year than I had before reading stuff and not being online and like really making an effort to do things like go for walks outside mm -hmm. with people. And uh, in Istanbul, we've been fortunate that our museums and galleries are open. And since they're by nature, COVID safe places, right. I can't meet them in a cafe or have dinner with them, but I can go look at an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So that's been sort of like, weirdly our new beautiful meeting place mm -hmm. even if it's only one or two people at a time like so right. there's for me it's been like a super crazy person emphasis on like how can we do stuff in real life yeah. um maybe if i was 22 it'd be different but, but since i'm not um you know it's become like a like a hyper value thing so um maybe instead of like visibility, because that was the actual question. <laughs> <laughs> instead of visibility for how do I get more visibility of lots of people? Right. Maybe how do I go deep with few people? How do I, mm -hmm. you know? Smart. And also to be like, just on a, on a minor little personal note, like it's the first year in probably like 20 or 30 years where I haven't been on an airplane every month or every two weeks. And I've been able to be in one place. And so I'm actually not only been getting deeper relationships with the people in the city that I'm actually in. Um, I'm meeting people on my street that have been there for years that I never even knew they were there. <laughs> so, so more maybe, quality than quantity maybe, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's probably the short answer, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if, um, um, last question I wanted to, you know, address before I con congratulate you on your grant from the New York Foundation for the Arts. Um, it's really encouraging to see that these opportunities still are there. Um, but in your opinion, has there been a change in the financial support system towards the artists? Um, and would you be able to compare that of New York to Turkey? Sure. Yeah, thank you, Tansa. Uh, I was excited to get this grant because it was a difficult time. Um, and also I was honored to that it was in recognition of my ceramics and sculpture work. Um, I mean, coming from Turkey, it's hard to grasp the breadth of fellowships and grant opportunities available here. There's you know, hundreds of public and private foundations dedicated to supporting arts, and it takes a while to you know, get to know the field and pick the ones that could work for you, but it's a great resource uh, if you dedicate some time to it. Uh, I mean, and, and last year at the height of the pandemic, uh, a coalition of national arts grants organizations came together and started this artist relief fund to offer emergency financial assistance to artists. And, you know, they were offering uh, immediate and, you know, uh, emergency funding of $5,000 um, to help those in need. Uh, I looked into this, the fund closed in December after having, after having granted $20 million raised in direct aid and, uh, and their website states that they received over um, 155,000 applications, but were only able to award, you know, grants to only 4,000 artists, which is only 2.5% of the applicant pool. Mm. So um, you can see that there's more need out there for, uh, for these grants. And, uh, and of course, there's other programs that um, you, you know, you need a specific proposal and, you know, completion of a specific work to, to receive yeah. funding. But at this time, it's, it's great to have no, no strings attached funds to enable, you know, artists who are truly in need uh, to use the funds for anything they need and also to further their practice in any which way they want. Um, you know, since this is a Turkish American audience, I have to mention that this is a very important model uh, to support artists that doesn't exist in Turkey. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so apart from Saha, which started providing production grants um, for Turkish artists, you know, in international exhibitions, uh, I can't think mm -hmm. of any other foundation um, that gives out grants or fellowships uh, with a rigorous jury application or selection process. So. 
uh, especially now during the pandemic when artists need more assistance than ever, you know, local philanthropic institutions or, you know, in Turkey, corporations can come together like they did for Artists Relief Fund in the US and create a pool of emergency relief grants for artists with no strings attached. <laughs> you know, right. so, I mean, I hope this becomes a possibility in the future. Yeah. Um, thank you, Elif. Um, Marie, do you want to jump in from this, you know, perspective of our talk? Because, you know, Proto Cinema is also, you, you can look at it from the New York art scene and Turkey art scene because Proto Cinema is, uh, is a not-for-profit founded in New York. And it's, um, it's basically relies on government or not for profit, not let's say not government, private organizations or not for profits, mm -hmm. grants and fellowship mm -hmm. and commission works. So would you like to jump into this question before, you know, we head to the other issues? Because since we are talking yeah, about- Yeah, I think that, um, well, one of the things I learned this year, we spent tirelessly tons of hours uh, and time and resources and labor and uh, applying for grants. And we found out that not only is it 50% of it is being qualified and um, having all the material together. And you know it's very labor intensive, but 50% of it is finding the right kind of grant. You know, like that's half the job. So like there's so many different kinds of grants out there, but they're only for really specific kinds of things. And, right. um, and so uh, one thing is that for a, a nonprofit organization, I don't know if this would go true for a, an artist, uh, but that to have a healthy sort of balance of things to have part of the funds are private funds from you know your board and collectors that give to you part of it is from foundations and then part of it is from you know, other things like sponsorships or earned income or things like that to keep it balanced because if you only depend on private supporters and you have the american problem of like you know the personal agenda of the people and if you only go for the grants the grants are you know it's 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 very competitive and also a thick, thick thing to get into. So it's great. But um, one thing I think is important to mention here again is solutions looking forward is, uh, you know, we'll keep saying it again, again, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. We have to work together. And now that we're forced to, hopefully this will be things that will grow and we'll keep doing it when things, you know, are in the future. And then there's a coalition of about 32 nonprofits in New York, like Participant Inc, Anthology Film Archive, um, mm -hmm. Brooklyn Rail, that small organizations that have been applying as a group to larger funding bodies. And they got funding from like the de Kooning Foundation and the, Te the new Tiger Foundation, but their grants that they would never get as a small, or small organization. But since they were together, they were able to get like major support. So this kind of stuff has to continue. I think we have to just work together. So this sort of, you know, individual, you know, get out of the way, I'm going to get it, you know, instead of you, it's like, let's all get it together. So this is not just also in our fundraising, this is also in our, the content of our work and the way we do it is as important as how we do it kind of like that, so. Right. Uh, Proto Cinema commissions and like present site-specific exhibitions, you know, Istanbul, New York, all over the world really, um, don't you get artist-centered grants or is it always the, the organization Proto Cinema as a not-for-profit getting the grants or partnerships? Would you? Um, we do both. So yeah. we apply for um, you know, operating cost institutional grants. Like we got that support from the um, FFIA, Foundation for Arts mm -hmm. Initiative. But then when we're developing a project with an artist, we'll go and apply for grants specifically for something that's interesting, like for like Hera mm -hmm. Bhutashian who's coming up, for example. Yeah. She's yeah. interested in archaeology. She's, you know, has certain, you know, other concerns about migration. So we'll go after institutions and approach them. And again, the thing that's interesting is it's also a lot about personal relationships. Yeah. So in the way that like with working in a gallery, like you have to have real relationships with collectors and museum, you know, acquisitions, curators, like authentic yeah. long relationships build, you know, healthy um, mm -hmm. interactions. Same thing with the foundations. You, you know, go and have relationships with them and get to know them and talk to them have so they know about your organization and how it's running. And so that's also a strange thing in these times when we're, you know, having our relationships on this, this format. So, um, yeah. Um, so we kind of moved from backwards to front. So the, in, during COVID times, you su successfully managed to make the most, I think, out of these times by 
uh, with the launch of this group show across five cities called the Few in Many Places and Protozin. And this exhibition is kind of defined by the restrictions and curfews of our times. Um, what has been the reaction of the, the artist, the collector, the art professionals to this new series of exhibitions and protozin? Um, what, how do you, how do you reckon? How do you, what well, did, you um, did you observe? The reaction, well, the first reaction was when I made the idea and I started inviting the artists. You know, do you want to be in this shell? Yeah. Um, the idea was that each no, there's no flying, no shipping, and low consumption. So we're really mm -hmm. taking this on. Like, if we're going to say it. Let's actually really do it. And, and so, no visitors, uh, there won't be any. Um, most probably, there won't be any visitors to the space. I mean, like maybe right. very, yeah, very low. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So we say. So I called up artists like Michelle Lopez in Philadelphia and say, Michelle, do you want to do an intervention in your own city in a place that's already you know somehow functioning? or Burak Delier here in Istanbul in a bakery that's functioning as a, you know, an actual permaculture ekbichia itch bakery. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the artists love this idea. And I said to them, listen, the audience is gonna be just people who can get there walking in the neighborhood. It's gonna be art people and general public people that go there to, you know, buy their bread or, you know, do whatever. Um, and the artists thought it was great. So that was, that was good, so that was the first step. So then when we started getting it out there and do, actually doing it, the next thing is um, the visitors. And it was really kind of intense because you're talking about five different cities that are going through very different situations and we're being responsive to each situation. So right. like in Berlin with Hassan Osgur Top, they could have a kind of underground opening because it was a little bit okay at that time in Berlin and people could get together. But then in Beirut with Stephanie Sade, um, yeah. because of the explosion in August, like her work never physically was realized. It was conceptually realized. She made it, but then it got destroyed. So we had a completely, completely different kind of scenario. Um, uh -huh. It was really, it was really intense. And then not only, as we all know, like every situation, every city is very different to each other, but also every week it changes. Like one month and everything's completely, I was so April, 2020. Um, right. uh, but then the next layer was the, the press and the public. And we got like Kaya Gensch wrote a great text about it for Art Forum, you know, in the United States. And then we even got someone I never heard of, a beautiful magazine in um, India called Stir World. They wrote like a super articulate and great coverage. So we were reaching people, people were coming to us that we'd never even like conceived of before. So that was that kind of magic mm -hmm. happening. So yeah, I mean, it went so well, we're gonna do another one uh, this year too. Oh. Okay, that was what I was gonna ask you. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> we, we, we are, we, are you gonna repeat that? You, you're planning We're gonna on... repeat it in six cities. Seoul, Bangkok, Istanbul, of course. New York this time. Wow. San Juan and Guatemala City. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Smart idea. I like this idea of um, far, far away, yet in my heart, commissions oh. and exhibitions. But it's also kind of grassroots, like, you know, you do little things in po pockets in different places, but then you connect them. So maybe we only had like whatever, 600 or 800 visitors in Istanbul, but they're also reading the zine where we yeah. commission writers to write texts about all the different interventions. And then you right. see in each place that it's also going on somewhere else, that we're not alone. Like there's, it's happening in Philadelphia and it's happening in Montreal with Abbas Akhavan. So it has a collective you know, interconnected feeling too, and that we, we feel empowered, hopefully. We do it in real life and we also do it digitally and we're not alone. Right. I, I want you to to also talk a little bit about the Proto Cinema Emerging Curator Series and the screening tour, because given the closed borders and curtailed travel, uh, how do you perceive these objects and be visible? Um, the... Well, visibility is an interesting, that's, thank you, Tanza. I know, um, I, I, I keep bringing that because. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the Emerging Curator you Series. It. You have to see it, that one. Yeah. Yeah, you have to see it. Uh, but the thing that's interesting is this year, um, Albert Turan is curating it and he was responding to the um, actions uh, by the Turkish government about the LBGT community and their very active uh, legislation against uh, the rainbow. 
you know, right. schools on different things and banning that. Um, and so they're understanding this is a signifier of a certain community. And so his exhibition, which is gonna be in Istanbul in a, um, an artist run space called Poche by Larissa Arraz. Um, it's an underground space, it's an apartment gallery. So we'll be able to have visitors, but of course it'll be like, you know, COVID regulated two or three at a time kind of thing. But he invited artists who are all responding in some way to the visibility, the kind of visible signifiers of how do we stay present and visible to each other, but not visible to someone we choose not to be visible to. So no more rainbow, fine, but there's something else. And we'll figure out another way to have dialogue without hiding. So we stay visible to a selected um, readers, let's say. I see, yeah. So that's how that's gonna happen. Um, guys, I'm really enjoying this uh, this conversation, even though my computer keeps on giving me a battery low sign, which freaks me out. Um, but, um, well, I kind of, you're all so positive that I kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and I, I don't want to dwell on the negative effects of the COVID times from any, from many hats that I'm wearing. But last but least, I would like to ask each one of you to just like give a brief um, um, clairvoyance, <laughs> you know, like a projection, imagination, opinion um, uh, on the, on the, COVID-induced um, attitudes, that like given the COVID-induced attitudes, adaptations, and manifestations, what would your best bet be with reference to the new models of existence and agency? Hmm. Shall I go first with that? Sure. Um, I totally go with the positivity. And I think one, I mean, one reason I got involved in the art world in the first place, it was one thing you actually had to get up from the couch, go to the door, leave your house and go in, into a museum or a gallery. And I think during this time, so much would have transferred to online and will probably stay there from the way we shop, the way we communicate, the way we you know, view so many things. But when we are able to kind of travel and get out and commune, the art world will still encourage us to get up, get out and go and see things in real life. So I think it will be one of the catalysts for kind of us communicating and communing again. And I think it will lead the way in how we do that and how we do that better and how we build those communities. And I think we'll just find that it's less, I think it will feel more inclusive. Um, and I think we're seeing institutions, I think institutions have led the way in some of the thinking around how people have responded to COVID. Watching museums become, you know, anything from food banks now to vaccine centers, you know, I think that's extraordinary. And suddenly yeah. you see the versatility of these, you know, they're not just art viewing sites, but they're community sites. And I think people who have gone to these museums that would never have even known that they were, you know, in their neighborhood, I think that's exciting. And I think the art world should take, you know, hold some of that close. I also feel we could end our, our value system a little bit. And I think the, the, the art market was really pushing money and, and, and collecting to the very top and sort of pushing down the artist and their involvement. And I think we just need to realign that and accept that none of this would happen without the artists in the first place and their thinking and their creativity. And we sort of need to slightly honor that and kind of put it on the pedestal that it deserves. I, we, we may be a little bit punished huh? <laughs> for that. <laughs> so, um, what's your take on that? Um, Elif, would you like to say a few words on that? Uh, sure. I mean, I have some wishes. <laughs> well, you know, right. as we discussed. Yeah, all the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, you know, things, uh, hopefully there's light in the end of the tunnel, but there's also, you know, um, I mean, there's, what COVID has exposed is that, you know, there's, you know, a lot of inequities that, you know, were accelerated. So, I mean, I think we should still, um, you know, try to, you know, strive to close the gender um, and racial pay and representational gap in the art industry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in, in terms of, we were talking about the women and, you know, there's also um, minorities and, you know, um, anyone besides white men 
<laughs> uh, lagging far you know, behind in terms of pay uh, prices of their work, uh, public private collections, museum and gallery shows, and any other kind of representation and acquisition. And, and uh, you know, as Simon and Marie uh, stated, there has been a heightening of consciousness around these issues for a while and an effort by you know, a lot of institutions to you know, rectify this, but you know, there's, uh, there's still, you know, it's still lagging and, you know, there needs to be more effort made in this area uh, and hope we can, you know, come, you know, work together um, for, to, to, to achieve that. And also, you know, I hope this, um, you know, um, becoming face to face with, with this situation can also curb, you know, some of our own individual consumption and production habits. Uh, be it less air travel or you know more remote conferencing uh, or producing with local resources or you know focusing on producing in a more environmentally conscious way um, you know we we can be prioritizing of our uh, values uh, as individuals and as a community which I'm hopeful for that's great um, Marie um well, aligned, obviously, that the, um, the issues that we're standing before, like UBI, the basic income, um, yeah. uh, has to be worked out. The race issues everywhere have to be worked out. And then clearly, we need trusted information sources, of which we have none. And so it's, you know, put a really hard press on um, all the other things. Mm. Um, and I definitely hope that when we travel, it'll be a lot less and that we'll go places and maybe stay a lot longer. Like I was walking on Buyuk Ada with a friend and we we're saying when people came to the hotel, they would stay and they would get mail at the hotel and their mm -hmm. kids would know all the people in the hotel. Like you go and you stay long enough that you get mail there, what? I think right. this would be beautiful, you know, like why do we have to rush in and out? Um, and um, yeah, and I think that in order for there to be actual, all the equity we're talking about with race and class and stuff that we all have to just, have a little less. I think it's okay. You know, it's not, it's not okay. It's essential. So, uh, those are the things I'm lo looking forward to. Living with yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I I mean, like maybe we would agree, but I'm just realizing that museum shows are the duration of an exhibition is longer now. No. Yeah. I mean, which uh, coming back to your point, if we were in Bukada and like we wanted to see a show and we actually could get mail there would be like, you know, what, you know, <laughs> sort of having good, yeah, so, yeah, would have given us more ample time to absorb and what Simon says, like to digest. Um, I will say there's never been a better time to go to museums in New York than now. So if there's ever, I mean, to go and see Donald Judd at MoMA and be the only person in the room is really a treat. Um, and the Met the same. I mean, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a sort of melancholy about it, but it's really an extraordinary experience. So if anyone is in the city, that's, you know, the museums need your support, but it's also an incredible experience. Okay, guys, look, I have uh, questions from our audiences. Selma Burma is asking, there should be more exhibitions and opening ceremonies of them from now on, I think. So I want to ask all participants that where would art events take place in the future? Streets, squares, gardens of the public spaces? You know, one of my favorite sort of biennial exhibitions in recent years, very much pre-COVID, but sort of was a premonition, was a manifesta that took place in Palermo uh, mm -hmm. a number of years ago. And uh, the way it activated that city it took, in, it took place entirely in, in the gardens as street parades, kind of in dis, you know, disbanded houses and palaces and a city that was really, you know, had, had, was rough around the edges. You were given this kind of walking tour uh, and it was an opportunity to kind of really explore the, you know, the dark recesses and corners and beautiful hidden spots. I would love to see more of that. I would love to see more exhibitions right. sort of take place in the open air and you know involve you know more live performance and you know more audience again i think that would be extraordinary elif or marie well i mean yeah it's it would be great to move more um more work outdoors and you know provide that opportunity especially you know i mean turkey is like just 
very ripe for that, I think. But um, I also, I think museums and galleries are still viable places to see art, you know, with COVID regulations. I mean, mm. we need to preserve these institutions because mm. they're an important way of, you know, I mean, they're important for, you know, um, the audience as well as the art industry. And, and as we can see from what's going on in New York museums, there's been, you know, no um, instances of transmission. And they've been open for a month. And, you know, we haven't mm -hmm. heard of any outbreaks. Uh, they, they've been managing it really well. I mean, since there are no tourists, it's, it, things, I mean, places are very empty, but, you know, I think galleries are open as well. So, um, you know, we can build on that because um, I think we're going to have to live in a more uh, socially restricted way for a while in the future, but we can have these institutions open. Marie? I think it's a, um, it's a both and answer outside in the mm -hmm. streets in like unexpected places and in our old, old school galleries and museums. I think like, let's, let's do it everywhere, you know, why not? Well, you're obviously for, you know, like anywhere, any, any site is possible kind of. Exactly, idea. yeah. But like in the new norm, I'm expecting, yeah. I mean, if these restrictions kind of stay with us, like, um, I don't know, do museums have a maximum capacity in one go situation? I know the galleries do. They accept like here in Turkey, Istanbul, like four to five people at mm -hmm. one certain point. Um, I kind of wonder if it's going to move forward. They're going to move forward with this. Um, except that, you know, like you, you will have to wait in line to get in to show because they will be expecting only, there will be a capacity, maximum capacity at one certain period of time, right? So, yeah, we'll and also the opening. So, that's been a loss not to be able to celebrate the opening of an exhibition and, and be with people and, you know, the conversation no. that goes alongside that is you know another you know pillar of what makes the art world an interesting place to be so that's sort of how it will be hard to that, I mean, it's, you know we need to think really creatively as to how we can keep some of that, that energy and, and and kind of no. community alive i want to do this thing called stay away <laughs> cabaret stay away cabaret yeah, so yeah. basically like a big outdoor space and instead of like a regular cabaret where the tables are like, you know, right next to each other and we're mm -hmm. like having our drinks and there's a stage that yeah. the tables are like six meters away from each other, <laughs> like a football field. So we get together, but in like a way that's fun to be like, you know, figure out a way like this. Right. So then I imagine, you know, in, that we would see lots of art and do lots of stuff in the in the warm weather and then the winter weather we'll go more internal and do our, our reading and writing and small group things like maybe there'll be a influx and influx you know in and out kind of thing of you know an external life and an internal life more like you know farmers or something like that so we have another question uh according to your observations do you think that people became more interested in art and creativity in general during the pandemic also, can an artist convey his or her message or the feeling of the piece of art they created through online means? Oh, and the, the question is done. So, well, that, okay, here you go. Um, also, can an artist convey his or her message or the feeling of the piece of art they created through online means of view, viewing and communication? And we have about seven minutes to end this webinar. Please go ahead. Well, this is also another thing with two sides. There's on one side, there's lots of museums and galleries full of paintings and sculptures and things that sell in a conservative market because we people need to survive. On the other side, there's lots of artists making VR, AI videos and stuff that is made to be on a screen. So I think both those things are yes, yes. I say yes. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely been a, a you know, and, and thank goodness, video artists have definitely had a moment in the sun because people have had time to sit at home and, and, and watch content that they just wouldn't have otherwise. So I think, and that, as Mari says, is, is you know, it's, it's a great place to do so. Uh, I can't say, I think, you know, you have to stand in front of a painting or a sculpture to really understand it. I don't think there's ever gonna be a online replacement for that. Mm -hmm. um, but, 
knowledge building, I think there is, you know, that's been a strength. I was very resistant to the number of Instagram conversations, you know, back in April when it first happened. Uh, but then realized it was such a wealth of wealth of knowledge to learn and, and, and get to know the personalities of some of these artists that you just didn't know you knew their work. But you, and you know, there's an intimacy in that format that is kind of remarkable. You feel like you're sort of ear wigging on someone's conversation, which is sort of fascinating. And you know, I, I sort of my whole attitude towards it kind of did a 180. And I became right. a kind of, you know, I couldn't get enough of listening to, to various conversations. All right. Elif? Well, my work is very analog and um, tactile and handmade. So I, um, you know, I, online viewing is definitely not the ideal way to, you know, experience that kind of work. Um, it's less than ideal, but it's what we have to do. And it's, it just, um, you know, pushes us to create, you know, be more creative about presenting the work or trying to create more context and ideas around the work to communicate um, in a more verbal <laughs> way. And, you know, showing slides on the screen is not the same as, you know, showing a physical work to a person that's in the same physical space with you. But, um, you know, we have to try to do both at this time. And, you know, um, we train ourselves and, you know, I think, um, you know, there's, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be done uh, digitally as well. But, you know, hopefully the, you know, physical spaces and togetherness uh, in, 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 you know, it can be in a restricted way, but we'll come together so we can all be in the same environment, so maybe six feet apart, but still experience the work in a, you know, right. physical way. Well, I, I personally think that pandemic has created not particularly like not I, I, I didn't want to say but artists are already creative people but in general the public has become more creative with mm. within the, the realm of social media don't you think so like <laughs> the post of Instagram the, the <laughs> statements the, the the TikTok videos this and that I'm like oh my god you know like people are so much time sitting at home and <laughs> just they're just like non-stop posting all this really creative by yes. the way um posts news you know jokes um caricatures this and that so well my my part would be to the, to the first part of the question to say yes i think people got more creative those people who intended yeah. actually well guys um we were only three minutes away but if there are no more questions let me check again well, maybe while you're checking, I can just say that there's an organization called 2020 Visions. Um, and they did a summit recently and their whole thing is that artists think in very creative ways and they're bringing that creative thinking to solving other problems. They're partnering them with like, you know, people from other sectors, like this cross sector creative solutions is, is happening. And that's something I, also uh, positive from this year. So, I mean, like really my battery died, right? <laughs> <laughs> just at the right time. Roaming Tanza. <laughs> um, yeah, I am just on my phone now. So I'd like to thank, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank all of you, Simon, Marie, Elif, for taking part in this wonderful talk series. And I'd like to also thank American Turkish Society for giving me this opportunity. Have a great time, guys. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Nice to see you all. Bye.